Thank you for being here on Saturday morning. And this talk is about the, the still unnamed tool that we are developing in the University of uh, Venice. And it's about uh, a project that we started to do to uh, understand if you can actually make a, a wireless link. And then from there, on the research point of view, what we try to do is try to understand how mesh networks may grow, what are the topologies, characteristics, and so on. So uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, I am a professor at the University of Venice. And up to a couple of months ago, I was at the University of uh, in Trento, in north of Italy. And I was uh, coordinating the NetCommons uh, project that you have heard about uh, from Panos, mostly. And uh, it, it was a really nice uh, project that I will spend a few words about. I'm also a member of Linux.org in, uh, in Florence. That is my hometown. And yeah, and that's more or less what I, what I do. So a few words about NetCommons, because uh, it's something that uh, I think we are really proud of, uh, because this it was a three-year research project financed by uh, the European Union. And it was all about community networks. Uh, we had six partners, and it was a strongly uh, interdisciplinary projects. So we had uh, computer scientists, social scientists, uh, legal schoolers like Virginie, um, ourselves, NetHood, uh, like Panos. And we did a lot of work with the community. And also, uh, we, we tried to split the work into something that we call like the global impact and the local impact. And just to, to show you a few things that we have done, uh, we have been working with uh, huge organizations that were framing the legal uh, aspects of uh, communications in Europe, like the EU Parliament. And Virginie, she's not here today, but she can tell you a lot of the work that we have done to try to steer the, the legislator in a direction that was more friendly for community networks. Because at the, t the, the um, telecom package is a new package that was basically rewriting all the, the, the whole rule set in, in Europe. So it was exactly the same, the, the right moment. And they didn't have a clue about the fact that there, is, there is something that is called community network. And in general, uh, even if they do not have specifically a negative intention, but if they do not know that you exist, then they may do stuff that will hinder your growth. And so we, we went there and we convinced them to uh, change some stuff that I cannot even uh, resume because you have to talk to Virginia and the legal team. Same stuff with UNESCO. They were actually uh, elaborating some uh, criteria with which they uh, evaluate the, the way that state behave in terms of ICT and social impact of ICT. And we were able to convince them to uh, put one single bullet about community networks and the fact that the state can actually let you or encourage you to do your own communication uh, network. And, and then we had some other stuff at the local uh, uh, level. We have been working with Giphy, we have been working with Linux. Uh, we have a lot of documentation and a lot of stuff that you can actually read. It, it's, it's a European project, which means that there is a lot of paperwork. And I know that it's, it's hard for those that have not been involved to go and check what it is about. But there are some of the things that I, I would really like to invite you to, to see because, uh, for instance, the whole work package one and all those deliverables here, they all describe the way that some of the community networks that we enter in contact with work. So in terms of uh, governance, in terms of uh, the way they take decisions, how they fa finance themselves. And, and there are also, for instance, uh, uh, good patterns and bad patterns. So um, directions that were taken and worked, directions that were taken and did not work. So do not repeat the same errors and so on. And then we have some code. We have some uh, things that are more in the political aspect uh, rather than in the local aspect. And, and, yeah, and then best practices. So we have a lot of material. And so I invite you to take a look at it because we, it took us a lot of work. I hope it's, it's useful for also for those networks that we did not actually involve in the project themselves, because we could not involve everybody. So um, 
this tool here is something that was not originally part of the of the project, but it was an idea that came in the process, and it basically has a double nature: uh, something that we do for research and something that we are now trying to do for communities so that they can use. And this tool has basically three components: that is one. Uh, uh, database of open data that you can actually uh, fill it, uh, fill in with your specific open data from your country, uh, a few radio models taken from uh, literature and from uh, the data sheets of some devices, and an engine that simulates the growth of the network. Let's say that under a research point of view, this is the thing that is more interesting to us, but uh, for everybody else, these two points here are uh, really useful uh, anyway. So what we did, Okay, a little of warning. Uh, this uh, is, is really early. I mean, we have been producing this for a deadline that was uh, a few months ago. So we have the code uh, in GitHub, but it's really, uh, we have to keep working on it to improve it. Consider this more as a, like a proof of work, something that you can actually do. Uh, and we can work together if you're interested to do it in the best way that uh, works for you. The, it's pretty complex, and in the research part and in the network growth part, there are a lot of heuristics that are the one that, at the moment, we consider better, but we, we can always improve. And yeah, and let's see. So basically, uh, we start fr from collecting uh, data about uh, building altitudes. So w one of the problems that you always have when you have to make your link is understanding if there is line of sight. And this is something that uh, you have to go there on, on the buildings and check if there is line of sight. And actually, there are many public administration that public the data on surface level that include the building height. These are generated with something that is called LiDAR, which is a technology with which they, they pass through with, with planes or whatever, and they just do measurement with laser, and they actually uh, can reconstruct the whole shape of the city. And there are many um, public administration that share this data for free. For instance, we could get a lot of data from the region of Tuscany, where Florence is, is my hometown. So we worked on those data, but there are many other. We were working on data uh, from Lyon, because the city of Lyon published uh, a lot of data with a lot of, um, uh, they're very precise. So we were doing uh, uh, examples and we were doing experiments there. And then what we did, uh, basically, we, um, we took the uh, shapes of the building from various sources, again. Uh, primary source is OpenStreetMap, uh, which is pretty precise in urban areas. It's less precise in uh, rural areas. In, in Italy, we could actually get uh, access to Catasto. It's, it's the national... Uh, uh, database of buildings shapes, which is um, less updated normally in, in urban areas, but it's more updated in, in rural areas. So depending on the situation, we, we pick one or the other. And so for each couple of buildings, we can actually compute if there is line of sight. So if you can actually have line of sight. And then we do some uh, computation on the fact that the Fresnel zone, uh, which is the, well, the area that waves travel to uh, is par partially obstructed or not. And, and we used some uh, very, easy, um, uh, very easy mechanism to try to understand what is uh, the loss, the path loss from one point to the other, considering the distance and the occupation of the Fresnel zone. And so just for you to understand, this is, for instance, a piece of Florence. And here, we Okay, uh, this is the, the ground level, these are, no, sorry, the, this is the ground level, these are buildings, and this is a, a, a hill that is uh, growing in, in, in this, so I'll show you, this is, that's better, so this is the hill, and these are all the buildings, and these are the streets. Somewhere around here there is my house in Florence, and what we do is we actually put buildings from OpenStreetMap, and we can actually try to estimate the height of each building. Because normally, those data, which you cannot really see them now, but they, they are pretty rough. So it's just like a, a pyramid uh, that is centered in the building. And if you have the shape of the building, you can try to obstrude it and try to guess if it is something like a cube or something like that. And so uh, in the end, what we are able to do is this. 
so this is, for instance, is something that we did in, uh, in, in Lyon. And, and we wanted to, there are different things because we are using three different databases. This is the LIDAR database from Lyon, which is very, very precise. This is the same database with a downsampled precision because computationally it's pretty tough to compute this stuff. And this is SRTM. SRTM, it's, um, it's another free database that you can use uh, and it's, it covers the whole world, basically. It, it, I think it was released from by, by the NASA, but it's very rough and I've seen a few projects using uh, SRTM. You can use SRTM to understand if there is a mountain, basically, but not if there is a, a building. These are the same places. <laughs> so it's telling me that, yes, there are like three meters, a couple of meters of distance from here to here, but it, it's not, it's interpolating all that is in, in between. And from here, basically, this is the Fresnel zone, and there are models that tell you that if there is, for instance, one spike that is punching in the Fresnel zone, then you have to add some kind of loss to the simple path loss that you can actually compute with the freeze equation. And, and we try to do this and find out uh, some value of approximate uh, loss in this distance. Then, uh, we collected uh, data from uh, a few uh, ubiquity devices. This was July, uh, past year. Um, and basically, in those data sheets uh, tell you what is the signal that you have to receive, the minimum signal you have to receive, to negotiate a certain bitrate in 11N or AC or whatever. So based on the uh, assumed uh, bitrate, uh, assumed path loss that we compute, we can more or less guess what is the maximum bitrate that a specific device would uh, negotiate on that link. And of course, here we are uh, assuming point-to-point uh, -point links, and we are we in the data sheet we consider also the uh, the spanning the uh, aperture of the of the antenna, so that when we make um, a link, when we consider a link between two points then you can actually also include the fact that it's effectively in the center of the lobe or somewhere out of the lobe. And there is some tolerance also in how much loss you can have if you're not specifically in the center. And yeah, this is okay. I will take this risk because there is a student uh, of us that made a, a web interface for this, which works <laughs> once. <laughs> which works once in a while, and yeah. So this is Florence, let's see what happens. It, it may not happen, work, I'll tell you. So basically what this guy is, is asking me if, um, uh, this is the, the maximum height of the, of the pole that you can mount. So what he's asking me is, okay, how, how tall is your pole? And I'm gonna tell him 100 meters, just because I know what's, what's in between. And then he's asking me uh, effectively what, what is the kind of radio that you want to use and if this works. You have this uh, pretty usable interface uh, that tells you that uh, if you have, uh, if you use uh, two poles, then now, right now for simplicity, we are uh, using poles of the same uh, height. So you need two poles of 76 meters because I have picked two locations that uh, where the Duomo of Florence is exactly in between. <laughs> so this is to show you that the data are pretty good. Yeah. So you can actually see the shape at a very good precision. And yeah, and of course, if you want to go through the Duomo, you need a, a very high uh, poles. Uh, this is the, the loss that it computed because probably this is not just path loss, but there is also something that you are missing, you're, you're losing because there is uh, a spike in the Fresnel zone. Uh, and this is the um, negotiated downlink and uplink with these devices over here. Uh, noise. Without noise. That, that's of, I mean, we cannot know if there is, if there is noise. If everything is perfect, if you change the devices, So 
the negotiated bitrate changes because I, I got some ISO 50. This is this are power beam with a very huge uh, dish. Question? So you you choose two points and uh, you said you had 100 meter poles and the algorithm you choose 67 as mm -hmm. the height but it has some packet loss. With a higher pole you would have no loss? I mean... Uh, yeah, I mean, the actually the, the web interface itself is more like just to show how it could work. The, the real work is behind it. So it's the database and the APIs that allow you to do this. So basically, what you can the, the API is simply uh, you give them two points and uh, a specific height, and it, it's going to tell you these numbers here and and the devices. And this is just because uh, realistically, you want to know more or less if it's doable or not. And in this case, what the, algor the algorithm is doing is just picking the minimum height of the pole that allows you to have line of sight. So if you probably if you use a uh, highest pole, uh, higher pole in here, you're gonna have a better uh, loss because effectively you're not going to interfere with the Fresnel zone. But uh, I have to say that this is extremely heuristic because the, the the Fresnel zone itself depends on the antenna that you use. So this is an ideal situation. But when you change the device, the Fresnel zone will change itself. So you have to use this with with granosalis. This is basically the best you can have. In, in the best conditions. Thank you. So now that this worked, I didn't, I won't touch it anymore. And and yes, uh, a few more things. Um, this is more on the research side of the story, and it's uh, something that I find really interesting because the goal here was. Um, Let's try to understand how much such a network can grow. So assuming that you have a negotiated bitrate per link, and assuming that you have one gateway somewhere, and assuming that this gateway has um, infinite uplink, so the, the uplink is not the, the bottleneck, how many nodes you can stuff into this network? And this is, uh, if you know exactly where to place the node, it can be something like a planning tool. In our case, it was more like a research effort to try to understand with a lot of attempts, with random nodes, how much this network can grow. And have some figures that are going to tell you, okay, if you use, ah, something that I didn't tell you, here we are using uh, 20 megahertz channels. So that's why these numbers are, are pretty small, but you can actually change them. 20 megahertz is because uh, when you build a network uh, and it, you do it with point-to-point -point antennas, you always have to choose a channel for each of the link or whatever. And 20 megahertz gives you enough channels to be able not to interfere too much with the others in the neighborhood. So this is the choice, but you can actually change it yourself. And, and so the idea was, uh, okay, uh, let's assume that we want to give uh, uh, let's say one megabit per second to each of the user and in in saturation condition one megabit to the gateway uh, how many nodes can we support if we let the network grow randomly so we pick random locations and then we connect the new nodes to the existing one and to do this uh, uh, basically, uh, you, we pick random uh, positions, we connect to existing nodes, and we stop when a certain percentage of the nodes have less than uh, one megabit per second, or two or five, or whatever we want to have. Um, and this is actually horribly complex, because uh, computing the available bandwidth per node, it, it's, it's hard. Because basically, what the available bandwidth per node is the minimum bandwidth in every link that composes the shortest shortest path to the gateway. I say shortest, but it can be like the best path, whatever metric you use. So it means that you have to compute for each link the available bandwidth and divide it for the number of shortest paths that pass through that bandwidth. Now, if you use um, ATX metric, 
then uh, you are just using, you're just estimating the loss, and the path that you use does not depend on the available bandwidth. But if you use, for instance, a time metric, then the shortest path that you pick depends on the bandwidth available on each single link, which means that there is nothing like first we decide the shortest path and then we compute the bandwidth. We do it all together. And if you do this, uh, I mean, we, we do not know how OLSR behaves in this network. It just goes. So whether you implement it or you have to make some heuristics about how it could work. So there is a lot of uh, tape in uh, what we have been doing so far. And it's a tape that we are going to improve. But basically, um, we wanted, I will not give you the, the, the results of the, the many results. The only thing that I want to show you is something that we said, okay, uh, we can use this um, approach to decide which is the best neighbor that you want to connect to when you add a node. And generally, you are the node, and uh, you have this, this criteria is the one that you use. You connect it to the, to the node that gives you the best bandwidth on that link, because it's the simple and more reasonable thing. While something that would be nicer is you connect to the node that you know will share the load in an even way in the network, in a more fair way in the network. To, do, to be able to do this, you have to be able to compute the load on links, and you have to be able to more or less estimate when one single link is overcrowded and it will be a bottleneck. Because your goal is that the links that come out of the gateway, they are saturated. If you do not saturate those links and you saturate some other links, then you are underusing your resources. Because if you have one gigabit at the, at the gateway, you want to have one gigabit uh, in the sum of its links. If you do not reach the maximum in the sum of the links, it means that the bottleneck is somewhere else. So your network is not well planned. You could have done better. And if you actually do choose your next hope based on the greedy and the local metric, the best link I can do here, you will not saturate all the bandwidth on you, around your gateway. And this is like something that we, we did. This is uh, in, in Florence. Uh, no, these are various uh, networks in, in Tuscany in different uh, areas. And this is basically we, we run the, the algorithm 10 times. Here you have the minimum bandwidth guaranteed per user. And this is the number of nodes that we can actually uh, achieve with one network. This is an average and this is a, a deviation. And this means that with, with our model, we can say that in Florence, with one gateway, you can have a network between 150 and 200 nodes in urban area. Well, this is urban, suburban, various areas in Florence. And here we are picking the, the neighbor just based on the greedy approach, so the one that gives you the best link bandwidth. While if you try to make something better, you can have a network that grows like even twice that size. Because, okay, just the, the, the only graph that I'm going to show you is this one. This is the bandwidth that every user has available for him. And what we, you want to have, this is with when the purple line here is when we want to guarantee one megabit per user. And you want everybody to be here. You, the, the best thing is that everybody has one megabit. And if you use the network aware metric, so you try to distribute the load, you get something, you get really close to it. But if you do not use the, the metric, you, you, you have this kind of stuff. So you have a lot of nodes that have more and a few ones that have exactly one megabit per second, but in the overall number of nodes is less. So you're not using this capacity. Because they, they, they have bandwidth, but the, someone else that doesn't have it. So at some point, you cannot grow anymore. Because if you put another node, you, will, you won't have the bandwidth that you are promising. And that's more or less it, I think. Then I have a lot of other numbers. But well, uh, I'm 
Ah, something that is nice, uh, we, uh, since, uh, <laughs> before I, I get choked, thank you. Uh, we were also able to estimate a cost per node. So we were considering, I think, 200 euros for each node as a fixed cost. And then we had the prices of the devices. And, and we were using a maximum of, I think, four devices per node, which is reasonable with a normal installation. And this was uh, the amount of money that you spend per node as the network grows. And basically, you see that at the beginning, you can have nodes with less than four devices. And then at some point, you, if you want to, to, to keep growing, all the nodes have to saturate the number of devices. And you will actually uh, have more or less a, a specific cost and the same cost for, for all the nodes in the in the This is the average cost per node as the network grows. And yeah, cost and number of devices. And I mean, there are a lot of other things that we, we plan to do with this, uh, but I think this is enough for today. And uh, the, the code is, bad code is by myself. Good code is by Gabriele, that was at the battle match past year and couldn't come this year. And the web interface is from Daniele. These are students uh, in Trento and in Venice. And then there is a lot of, a lot of work from NetCommons Spartan. We have a paper that is under review right now, and I can give it to you if you're interested. One question. Uh, your model works with only one gateway. Are you planning to expand to multiple gateways? In principle, it doesn't make a, a huge difference. As long as you can uh, compute shortest path, then if you have more than one gateway, then you add the node. And this new node will compute the, the, short, the best path to the best gateway. So you have more choice, you have more redundancy, but the model will not change that much in the growth of the what and did you try to run the algorithm with two gateways no not yet okay uh, what we are now trying to do uh, okay my my big picture is uh, like the thing that uh, you, you like I would like to achieve in five years is to show that this technology it's uh, it's fair technology and it has a social impact that you can actually uh, measure somehow and you can tune. So w what I would like to do right now is to start, we are picking now nodes at random and this doesn't make that much of sense. Uh, we want to improve the way we, we pick the node. How do you do this? You take uh, data from surveys, national surveys, that tell you uh, for each building, more or less, how many people live there, what's their average age, what's their average income. And from this, you build a model on how much they could be willing to spend to access the internet. And so you can actually try to understand uh, where is your network evolving. So is, it, is your network evolving in the direction of people that can afford it? Or what happens if instead of saying, I want one megabit per second, I'm okay with half a megabit per second? What are the people that I am going to reach or not to reach? And the coolest thing at all is when you start to uh, using other metrics and you start saying, OK, now I have my network and I tune it to work in a way that I reach the majority of people. Who am I reaching? Am I reaching neighborhoods that are based on, that are mainly uh, white Italian educated? Am I rich in neighborhood that are instead immigrants and uh, Arabic and whatever? And you are trying to understand how your knobs, technological knobs, bring your network to be more or less inclusive or more or less selective. That's, that's a big picture and the research point of view. And we need a lot of data, a lot of models, but that's where we want to go. I'm just going to ask where your code is. It's on GitHub. It's, it's pretty, mm, 
It, it's in the presentation. Ah, okay. I missed it then. Sorry. Oh, okay, okay, good. No problem. Ah, that's why I can't see it. Ah, it's 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 it's, it's black. It's, 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 yeah, uh, read okay. this. Realize, realize in a rush for a deadline. Okay. <laughs> But I mean, uh, we, I want to keep working on this a lot. So we are now redoing the tests, and we are going to try to improve it. Would need to change uh, the model uh, a lot to take in account, for example, using a topology that is not using only point-to-point -point links? No, the data sheet, in the data sheet, you actually can specify the, the antenna. So you can tell it it's an omnidirectional antenna, 360 degrees. And that's it. Because it will actually check if there is line of sight. The, the difference is in the calculation of the, of the bandwidth. So if you use it just as a planning tool, this is not going to do much. If you use it as a planning tool to try to consider what is the guaranteed bandwidth, then it will change because, uh, because it's really hard to model the interference between nodes that
that sometimes we do the uh, we, we, we check the picture from last year and we can uh, do the, the trees uh, move and <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this can be as accurate as the, as the data is, no, no more than that. For example, in Catalonia, I've been able to, to find LIDAR data that does um, a measure every half of a meter. Mm -hmm. That's the same as Lyon, I think. Or even Lyon has 30 centimeters or something like that. But this, this in most of the cases, this is not needed. I mean, uh, you do not want, when you do this, what you're what you're doing is you're taking like a a shape and you all the points in the shape and you are computing if the your line of sight is uh, if the points in the, any points in the shape is higher than your line of sight basically so you're doing a rough approximation the more points you have the more complex it is the best thing would be to do this on, on GPU but uh, this is another um, story. I mean, you have to start from scratch. So in some cases, having really detailed point do not help you. It just uh, makes you waste time. What would be nice would be to, to do some pre-processing and uh, so to have a shape. And some public administration actually give you the, already the pre-processed data. But it, it depends from the place. I think in, in Lyon, they do that. Uh, they have some 3D models and they map pictures on it. So you have really the 3D model with the actual image on it, mm -hmm. like uh, yeah, textures. It's, yeah. Thank you. Very good work. Uh, in the multi-devices nodes, you are considering using different channels, or are all the same channels? You can uh, in, in, when you do uh, well, when you do this uh, when you when you do this. It doesn't really matter. Okay, it's just just pick one channel and that's it. When you make the network grow, uh, then you have to decide uh, a channel allocation. Ah, I had this. This is just one example of one run of this in in Quarata, which is a suburban area. We we are using. Uh, um, a European category or UN categorization of uh, towns. That is urban, suburban, uh, rural, with, and so there are four categories, and we are trying to stick to those categories so that we can have uh, results that we can actually replicate in other places. So to say that, for instance, all rural areas should use this parameter better than the other, and this is one rural area close to Florence, and this is just one possible evolution of, of the network itself from the center of the. Uh, of the town uh, outside the, the other the other neighborhoods, and here what we do is we use a simple greedy uh, algorithm in which uh, you check uh, what are the, the channels with with which you interfere with, so the the others that are in line of sight with you, and in line of sight with the other guy, and you try to avoid channels that you are already using in your node, and the other guy is already using, and as long as you have 20 megahertz channel, you generally have enough to uh, avoid to hope interference. Roughly, but this is but this is an open problem. I mean, uh, uh, channel allocation it's it's complex. Thank you. Hi, um, are you thinking to add something like um, the general noise in the environment or like uh, the overall atom usage? Um, I mean, I could think imagine that it has quite an impact how um, with uh, competing network networks in your surroundings. Mm. So that the actual throughput you get might be very different from what is the best uh, thing to get. This it depends. I mean, I if you use it as a as a planning tool, you have you need the, the numbers. I mean, if you use it as a generic tool for uh, modeling networks, then you can put a model and say, okay, uh, I can ask to somebody from Freifunk to give me all the measures that they do in the, all the network, and then I do some kind of statistical model, and I put it in my evolution. But I think this is more interesting for me for, for, to publish papers rather than to community pe people that want to actually use it. In general, we use the, the data sheet, the ubiquity data sheet, uh, they, they already include the sensitivity of the radio. So th the only thing they want to know is the, the amount of energy you receive. 
And then you can have add some nice figure and try to guess what they will do if you have the nice figure for for that specific node. So it can be done, yeah. So if there are no more questions, um, actually we developed a tool that Mathieu was talking about, which is kind of similar. So if that's okay with you, I can do a short demo. I mean, it's related, so yeah, yeah cool. You need my plug? Sure. You need my plug? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay, sorry. So this is a tool we, we developed. So it was actually started by Theta Neutral in Toulouse uh, six years ago, something like this. And I, I rewrote it in Django, basically. <laughs> um, so the idea is that uh, when we want to do some link planning in our network, um, basically what we do is that on the super nodes, we take some panoramic photo. So we take like uh, 100, 200 photos that we then assemble in a big panoramic photo, which is very like uh, detailed. It can be like uh, 20,000 pixels wide, something like this. Um, and then we put that on the map. So here, this is my uh, community network. So the red points are um, super nodes, or future possible super nodes, basically places where we took this kind of panoramic, panoramic pictures. Then the green, uh, green is like a actual uh, people connected to the network, and orange are like people that want to connect, but we, that we couldn't connect yet. So it's about half, half, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so I will show you one of the panoramic panel pictures. Uh, whoa. So this is our main uh, location, so we took several pictures actually. Uh, let me So, quite nice view, as you can see. And you can scroll and zoom, zoom. Um, and as you can see, all the points on the map are also displayed on the panoramic photo, which is quite cool. It's incredibly cool. <laughs> <laughs> and so, ah, so how do we do it? Um, <laughs> Thanks for the question. <laughs> it's science, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> No, so basically what we do is that, uh, so we know where we took the picture, okay, the GPS coordinates, the elevation. Uh, we enter some like reference points in the database, like if you see mountains, mountain stop, we know exactly the location, the uh, elevation, or some like uh, churches, big buildings, uh, whatever is easily recognizable on the photo, okay? And then on this panoramic picture, so at first there's no point, and you have to click, like when you recognize something, Let's say uh, this one. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you see, but it's like uh, some kind of tower with a big um, round thing on top, so it's really recognizable. And we just say, okay, this is this um, reference point here on the picture. Okay, so we do like as much as possible. So all the blue points are these kind of reference points that we manually said this corresponds to this location. And then all the other points, they are like interpolated between these reference points. Okay? So uh, uh, the interpolation is like geometry. It's I wrote that code two years ago. I couldn't explain it to you now, but it's not that hard uh, math, basically. Um, so this is already cool, but then there's something even more cool. But you do it yourself, or you, you found some li library or something that does it for you? No, no, no. Um, I debated using like a um, PostGIS or uh, something like this, but it's just a Django app with a database and you have like coordinates and elevation. 
and I wrote the code to interpolate uh, this data. Yeah. Uh, where am I? Yeah. So now, so now what, what, what's even cooler? So these were all the points that are already in the database, like actual uh, people in the network or people that want to be in the network. But now let's say you come, you come to see me and you want to be connected. Okay. So let's say that you live um, near the train station. Uh, so near the train station, there's this big um, plaza, okay, with lots of buildings around. So let's say you live, uh, yeah, in the middle of the plaza. <laughs> <laughs> so now I just select locate this point. Uh, I have to enter the. So we automatically get the ground elevation, like uh, in France we have like a geographical institute. It has an API and just give it coordinates. It gives you like. Oh, this is 200 meters above sea level. Okay. With buildings or without buildings? No, without building. But then you have to manually add the elevation above ground. Okay. Because like if you live on the fifth floor or on the ground floor, it's different. So let's say, yeah, five meters above ground, and then locate. And then, uh, so this is the point I entered, and then it gives you all the panoramic pictures that points in the right direction, okay? So if you have a picture, like let's say here, that points in, in this direction, uh, we don't care about it, okay? Um, because it's not always 360 degrees. Sometimes it's just uh, direction. So it already filters uh, useless panoramic pictures. No, no, wait. How, how do you derive those line of sight? From the pictures that you took from the other So parts? it's like, uh, it's, not it's not line of sight yet. Uh, the idea is that uh, for each panoramic picture, we know the bounds, basically. Yes. Like this picture goes from this angle to this angle. Ah, okay. But we get from the interpolation also. Mm -hmm. And so if you're like in this uh, range, it's like, oh, possibly there's a line of sight. If you're outside, well, we don't know, we don't have the picture. So, so basically, these are the nodes that you know that there is a picture that yeah. might include that location. It's that only nodes that have pictures and that might include the point, yeah. So now, Let's say, so this is our main node, so I'll use this one. So, I will use. Yeah, we have several panoramic pictures in this place because we couldn't, it was too big if we had just one. So, yeah. And now I click on this one, and. That's the magic. That's the plaza we're building. So, you just point to in the right direction on the panoramic picture. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and so basically, like if you see a tree, yeah, okay. No land sap, but if you see your building, uh, you can recognize it. Yeah, it's fine. So, and the code is uh, on our uh, GitLab at the Federation FDN, uh, I think you can explore. Um, yeah, it's called Siluts, which is, I think, uh, a word in the local di dialect. <laughs> I think it's supposed to mean light in the local dialect uh, from Toulouse. Occitan, okay. Occitan yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's it. Save it. Oops. So, if you're interested to contribute, yeah, we could. Uh, so, basically, the. Pardon? Uh, oh, we don't have a license. Okay. <laughs> We should do that, yeah. <laughs> so basically, the backend is a just Django with a database. And then the front end is kind of a mess. I mean, it's working, but uh, so if you know like uh, JavaScript, view.js, or this kind of thing, we are interested uh, to improve the, the front end. Yeah. We can actually share the database and, um, so that it can easily be um, tried to guess 
what is the minimum bitrate. So the database of devices and the model to um, measure the, the path loss. Yeah, so yeah, because we have the points and yeah. Yeah, you could point in the right direction and say, oh, here you have 50 megabits. Yeah, yeah that could be cool. And then actually you are using a, a node that already has a device. So this, this device in, on, on top of the hill, a oh, yeah. node already has a device pointing somewhere. Yeah. You can tell you if, if actually you can reuse the same one. Yeah, yeah, you're right. So this is something I plan to do, but didn't yet. Like, yeah, enter uh, the actual antennas, uh, their orientation, uh, like elevation and so on. But yeah, then it, yeah, it will become a much more complete and complicated tool. For now, it's just like panoramic pictures and pointing the right direction. Yeah, and actually, to assemble these uh, huge panoramics, we are using uh, the Hugging so uh, software, which is uh, free software and uh, quite nice. But it lacks one feature: is that you, uh, with Hugging, you can only generate one big picture, which has a limited size because of the limits in the image formats that are used, PNG, JPEG, and so on. All have uh, size limits. But in the end, uh, Silutz is using tiles from this uh, huge picture. And so if uh, Hugin could directly general, uh, generate the tiles and not the huge image, that would be real cool. And so if some of you is more interested in panoramic pictures and wants to hack on Hugin to add uh, this uh, feature to export the, the panoramic the, the, the picture directly as tiles, that would be really help, helpful for Celuts and probably also for other uh, projects. Because uh, most of the projects that uh, publish uh, large panoramics on the web are based on some tiles uh, technology, so that would be really nice.